Thanks for tuning in. I'm Ben Aston, and this is the Digital Project Manager Podcast. So today I'm joined by Natalie Semchuk. Natalie, thanks again for coming on the show. And uh, this, who actually, for the first time in the Digital Project Management podcasting history, uh, Natalie is the first guest to reappear. So uh, a big, a big day today. <laughs> And uh, so today we're going to be talking about project failure, we're going to be talking about lessons learned, and uh, Natalie's fantastic DM, DPM-ish uh, newsletter, and anywhere else that the wind takes us. Um, so Natalie, we got to know you a bit last time, if you um, are wondering who Natalie is, uh, let me read from her bio. I think it's always embarrassing when people do this. Yes. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is what someone uh, it may have been Natalie, but someone wrote this about Natalie. Natalie is a consulting digital PM, working uh, remotely, living in Southwest US. She works mainly on small to medium sized agencies with in house web departments, managing digital projects, and implementing processes that help design and development teams. Um, and she also specializes in implementing project systems across remote teams. Natalie's written a load of articles on remote project management. So check those out if you're a remote project manager. Uh, and she also runs PM Reactions blog. She enjoys dystopian fiction, yoga and drinking too much coffee. She's also recently back from vacation. So it's uh, it's very special that we have her today. But um, actually, Southwestern US, it does sound a bit like... Um, are you hiding? <laughs> no, um, I am. Uh, I'm in Arizona. I kind of moved around a lot the last few years, and it got kind of tiring. Like, like updating bios and telling people, like, oh, <laughs> I'm actually not in that state anymore. I moved like last week, so I've been trying to be a little broader in my geographic location. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, save you from updating. That's a that's a good mm. call. So, uh, and how is Arizona this time of year? It's beautiful. We we just hit a milestone this week. Um, we have no more over 100 degree weather. So we are officially in fall. Um, so yeah. Icy, icy cold. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was in I was in Atlanta this week. And um, for so in Vancouver, where I am now, it's currently about 40 something. I'm trying to use American American temperature, I would say it's eight degrees. Uh, but in Atlanta, it was 80 something, around 30 something degrees. And it was hot and so sweaty. It was it was crazy. And coming back to Vancouver, I'm now freezing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but actually, I'm interested as a as an Arizonian. Is that what an Ari someone from Arizona is called? <laughs> <laughs> so where where do you go on holiday? Like, surely it, that sounds like you're in a nice part of the world. Where Where does someone from Arizona go on vacation? I am in a nice area. I mean, I'm like three hours from the Grand Canyon, which is pretty cool. Um, but mo for the most part, we all sort of are, find our way out of here in the summer because it just gets so hot. Um, I don't remember the conversion, but in a, in a Fahrenheit, it's about like 120 in the summer, 115 most of the time. Um, so people go out to the mountains or just leave the state entirely, uh, which I agree with all around, really. <laughs> That is 46 degrees C for all of those of you in the rest of the world who use Celsius. 46. That's halfway towards boiling. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> cool. And so, so tell me about that. Like, I know you. I know you're a remote, remote project manager, and you um, have been doing that for a while now. But what's the what's the deal with that? Why did you choose remote project management? Um, or did it choose you? Yeah, it was a little bit of both. Um, I I love it. I worked in offices like full time in the places that I lived for a long time and um, started freelancing on the side. And the only way that really worked out was to freelance with companies that were remote. And for the most part, the first few contracts I had were remote based. And I just found I really enjoyed that sort of lifestyle, I guess. So I can um, choose my schedule and choose what I do with my time a lot more freely because I'm not really bound to an office or, um, you know, commuting or things like that. But also, I don't know if people realize remote project management is pretty awesome because we can get our work done very easily. No one's interrupting, but I also have the benefit of like 
talking and communicating for a living. So I never feel lonely, really. Yeah, no, that sounds sounds pretty peachy. Mm-hmm. So, so with all this efficiency that's going on, and uh, with all being able to manage your own time, what do you do in your spare time? Then we didn't really cover this last time. What what does apart from being a PM, what does a PM do in their spare time? Um, I definitely have a little bit of a problem with work life balance. Sometimes I think it's the freelance part too. Whenever you're not working, you think about what you could be doing with your time. Um, but I do enjoy exploring the area. Like, um, you were saying, I live in, um, a really great part of the country and, um, Sedona is close by the Grand Canyon, all these really awesome, great mountains and, and trails and things like that. So I like to go out there, um, hike, uh, off-road, like kind of explore and take photos have not ventured into camping yet because there's a lot of scary bugs out here, but I'll get there eventually. (laughs) You just need some fly swatter (laughs) or or spray or a gun. Yeah. (laughs) I guess I would fit in then. (laughs) Yeah. Cool. Um, and one thing I've been meaning to ask you is whatever happened to your PM reactions blog? It's is listed. It's uh, is it has it been now? Has it come and gone? And now it's it's turned into DPM ish. No. What's the deal with that? It's still there. It's still there. All the all the gifts and memes are there. Um, every last updated second of April. I know. <laughs> I have a whole folder of gifts ready to go. I, like I'll, I tag them based on like emotion. And I just, I used to every so often load up like 50 at a time and auto post, but it's been a little too long. I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> well, maybe something to include in your, in your newsletter. Just maybe. an idea. I like the idea. Just an idea. Um, Cool. So it's been a couple of months since we last spoke. So mm-hmm. apart from going on vacation, what else is new? What's uh, What have you been working on? Have you found any new cool tools? What's, <laughs> what's new? Um, I've been doing a couple of new things. Um, I finished out a few projects this summer, started a new one um, right after vacation uh, with an agency in New York City, um, before that an agency in Montreal. And it's been great. I've been working with kind of a range of clients, uh, client projects. Um, and between that and working with sort of more structured agencies that all work in one location, but support remote work. Um, I'm the only full-time remoter. It's been really nice to sort of, um, see their processes and how they set things up and contribute to those changes. So I haven't used too many new tools recently. Um, I did get very into um, Team Gantt and Gantt charts recently. Um, again, I kind of used it for one project a long time ago, stopped for a while, um, got right back in and am relearning the ways of that. Um, trying to think of any other cool tools. Um, I've been using Meistertask, uh, which is sort of Trello-ish. Um, I'm not sure how it is with a team, but with a very small team or freelancers, that's been working pretty well. I think that's about it. Nice. I've never, I've never heard the term. I'm a remoter before. <laughs> is, is that what you call yourself Sometimes, in the biz? Yes. <laughs> I don't know if it's official though. I kind of just say that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And I'm, I'm interested. And for those, um, it might be an interesting thing just to touch on. So you work as a DPM and you uh, remotely, uh, you're working with agencies all over the place. Um, in New York, in Montreal, um, uh, other parts of the States. How do you get these remote PM gigs? Oh, man, I think that's probably one of the biggest questions for freelance in general. Um, When I first started, I looked for people um, looking to hire their first PM because they weren't really sure. Um, Typically, when you hire someone for the first time, like in the first role, you're not really sure how much um, work you have to fill their plates. So that's kind of where I... I found my space. Um, but in terms of remote PMing for like agencies and larger companies like that, a lot of it has been word of mouth. Um, you know, knowing one person who moves to another agency who then knows someone looking, um, or just sort of, um, 
being out there, um, you know, speaking at conferences, uh, writing articles, things like that. And it's typically, I typically am not like, I typically don't initially communicate with a person who needs to work with me. It's someone, it's like another PM who needs a lot of help and they've identified that and they kind of want to make it work. Or it's a business owner understanding they might need some space for their team to hire. Um, so it's, it's kind of a mix. So welcome back to the Digital Project Management Podcast for part two after Natalie and I, well, maybe mainly me, suffered a tragic internet failure. So this is the beauty of live. And uh, so, Natalie, thank you for telling us about um, how you get your remote project management gigs. Um, I will have to listen to the podcast to find out what you said. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Hopefully it's good. <laughs> because I disappeared. But uh, let's talk about your article. And if you haven't had a chance to read Natalie's latest article on the digitalprojectmanager.com, go and check it out. We've called it Why and How to Document Lessons Learned. Um, and the brilliant thing about this is that it's not just all boring theory, but uh, we've included or Natalie has created some really handy uh, lessons learned templates that you can download. And just to say, if you're trying to download them and you've got an ad blocker, you will need to turn it off because otherwise it won't work. Uh, but don't you just hate it when you find a template um, and you think, oh, yeah, that sounds good, but you've got no idea how to use it. Well, the good thing is, rather than just being an empty template, uh, we've given some PM inspo. Uh, yes, that is a valid hashtag, I think, uh, or will be soon, uh, complete with some lessons learned uh, filled in so you uh, can get a head start uh, in filling out the lessons learned template. Um, so... Let's talk about lessons learned for a second. Why is lessons learned even a thing, Natalie? Isn't that just the same as a project retro? What's what's the deal with lessons learned? Well, um, I know there is an official sort of uh, PMI like framework around this. Um, I'm not like formally trained, and to me, I see it more as project retros are really awesome um, with your team at the end of a project. But in order to sort of like perpetuate change and understand where things continually go wrong or, um, or are done well and how to apply that across multiple projects, especially, you know, if you're at an agency long-term or working with the same people longer term, um, it's really important to be able to track and understand that and, um, and, you know, grow from your experiences. Cool. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's so true. And why do you think it is? I mean, uh, do you find that on projects, or it must be interesting for you actually working with different agencies and different teams, mm -hmm. do you find that they're consistently all making the same kind of mistakes? Are you? Do you find yourself writing the same lessons learned each time as you're working with different agencies, or how does that work? Um, yeah, in my experience, it's always uh, the same mistakes and the same pains. Um, everyone has these commonalities. I mean, I think you can see that when you go to any kind of um, conference, like in our in our industry, and you see the different talks and always talking about, you know, conquering this project issue or, you know, that design process issue. Um, so I definitely think that every agency has that typical um, same overarching mistake or, or pain or whatever in their processes. And it's always interesting to see how different teams um, conquer that or deal with it if they haven't quite figured out how to um, fix it. So that's definitely, that's been huge for me. And I, I like to be able to at least track for myself what I, what I learn and what I see and how that might change um, my perspective when I go on to different projects with different companies. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, what do you find is then like, what's your top three common problem areas you think that, uh, that PMs are encountering? Um, I think there's always issues around sort of that estimating, um, project kickoff, like project expectation, um, area. It's really hard. You know, there's been, I think probably books written about the topics of estimating and it's always really hard to find, um, find a way to accurately estimate or bill for projects if you're not doing like upfront estimates. Um, I think timeline and, um, Timeline and like roadblocks that just aren't anticipated are always an issue. So things like um, if a client has to delay for a particular reason, um, 
even with the most solid process in place, it's really hard to plan for the unknowns in that way. So I've always seen similar pains around that. Like, you know, a client needs to delay for six weeks. Um, We might have a process in terms of like contractual obligations or how we bill that out or um, how we take a project back in. But there's not a really great way of handling that on like the capacity or resource side. Um, And I guess the third, hmm, third thing, I think handling everyone's expectations is always, always an issue. Um, There are lots of really great ways to document and update people um, in meetings and things like that. But there's always going to be some sort of expectation management, especially on a more, I feel like more um, agile and collaborative teams. It's harder because you don't always have that one true source of info. Um, It's harder to make sure all of those loops are closed and addressed appropriately. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I think I think that's great. And just on as a heads up for uh, those who are listening to the podcast, we've actually I'm actually working at the moment on a estimating mega article, which Natalie pointed out was one of the things that we often struggle with. Um, that uh, that we're going to launch in the next few weeks. So look look out for that. But for me, yeah, one of the most common problem areas I think um, that I seem to find is. Yeah, always around the the ownership of requirements, and on on different teams it works in different ways. But there's always a bit of um, uncertainty over exactly who's the person that owns the technical requirements. Um, does it start with the like, user experience architect? Uh, what role does the business analyst play? What role does the technical director play? What role does the PM play? Who's actually defining exactly how this thing works? And the requirements, uh, especially as we are doing like increasingly technical projects, um, not just owning those requirements, but managing them as they evolve throughout the process, I think is a a problem that just seems to crop up again and again. And uh, I think the part of the reason is is because the how that ownership changes throughout our project is partly to do with how well the team's collaborating together and and who you have on the team and what kind of project it is so it's very difficult to make a singular process that works for everything across all projects and across all teams but I don't know if you found that at all yeah actually I couldn't have said it better myself that's always a huge struggle um for me and it's you're right I think the root of it is like you can't always make a process that works perfectly for every person and every step that like in that way um to collaborate together so yeah it's a, it's a very real problem for me i feel like i'm going through that right <laughs> yeah. now <laughs> yeah and what would you say like thinking about the most important lesson that you've learned in your career so far what what's the uh any thoughts on on what that is or what that might be. Yeah, I think um, it's kind of like a global one, but never, ever, ever make assumptions. Um, there have been so many times where I've held back what I think is like a stupid question or, um, you know, I might be in a meeting and a decision was made, but I don't quite understand it. Um, and I might hold back like asking to clarify that. But every time I've done that, it's always... Um, I've always regretted it, (laughs) whether it's come back to um, bite me or it's like something someone else asks and it sparks like a massive discussion um, because everyone else uh, wondered that too. So I definitely try really hard never to assume other people know things, um, whether I'm communicating to them like as a client or not, or to assume that it's just, you know, I shouldn't ask that question or shouldn't clarify something. um, And it makes it like a lot easier to deal with because I'm I'm working from a very even playing field. If I just assume nothing, ask everything, say everything, um, clarify whatever is needed, and at least it's out there and something to talk about, um, which has helped a lot. Yeah. No, I think that's. I think that's great. And I think as a as more junior project managers, I think um, or someone who has less experience, they can be tempted to not ask what you think might be a stupid question because you don't want to you don't want to seem like you don't know what you're talking about or uh that yeah you don't want to appear stupid but i think yeah i think it's such great advice to be the person who asks stupid questions and be comfortable with that because um if you it's probably not a stupid question Mm -hmm. and uh 
you, in in bringing up these questions, it can often spark things that other people might not have thought about. And also, you're not going to learn unless you ask stupid questions as well. So <laughs> asking asking questions and not making assumptions, I think, is really helpful. Mm-hmm. I think for me, my the biggest lesson that I learned um, <laughs> early on in my career, we were working with a, a big... Uh, consumer electronics brand and uh, we had a a very interesting client and he he just refused to um, he refused to agree uh, to costs and so we'd he'd he'd kind of always kind of work on on the basis that hey let's just have a a gentleman's agreement to uh, to figure it out fairly afterwards and uh, of course, it never was fair, <laughs> and uh, we got burnt a couple of times. Eventually, we actually fired the client, um, but we got burnt really, really badly uh, because we thought, "Hey, we're in kind of panic mode. We just need to get this done. We know we need to hit this deadline. There's a big media campaign that's going live and above the line campaign. Um, let's just do the work and figure out the costs afterwards." In fact, this has happened. This has happened a few times with people that I've managed as well never agree to do the work um, before agreeing who's going to pay for it. Um, even if the client, if the, especially if the client thinks it's your fault and you think it's the client's fault, make sure that you agree cost up front. Otherwise, you're going to be in big trouble. Uh, so there you go. There's my lesson learned of the week. Um, cool. But just to finish, Natalie, do you want to tell us a bit about DPM-ish? We mentioned it earlier, but... Um, Tell us about this new newsletter that you've created. Yeah, so um, it's a weekly newsletter. goes out every Friday morning, um, focused on project management. I try to take kind of a different look at project management since it's a since it's a more personal newsletter. Um, I try to share my experiences or what's relevant to me that week and um, some cool links to read about, maybe things that aren't super related to project management, but might be interesting to all of us since we kind of touch so many different things in our projects. And um, this week, I just uh, launched a new feature with Patrice Embry of the PM Advice blog. So we're doing Ask a Project Manager um, every few issues, uh, and you can submit your questions, and, and she'll answer them. It's pretty awesome. I'm really excited about this week's topic. It went out this morning. And a link to the newsletter will be up on dpmish.com soon. Excellent stuff. Cool. Well, we are going to wrap it up there. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us on the second podcast that we've recorded today with you. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, hopefully this will all come together beautifully. Um, But if you'd like to contribute to the conversation, if you'd like to download the lessons learned template, go to the digitalprojectmanager.com, check it out there and be sure to join our Slack team as well, where you can find all kinds of interesting conversations going on, especially, I have to say, in the remote uh, PM uh, tea or Slack channel that we have of the of all the channels that are going on. If you're a remote PM, uh, there's lots of people chatting all the time about what they're wearing yes. and uh, whether or not they're going for coffee. <laughs> so it's always always an entertaining, always entertaining to follow the discussion. Uh, even if you're not a remote PM, they they're always talking about interesting things. So check that out too. But until next time, thanks for listening.